It's time for the biggest non-league football debate in the country. Search official BOTN and get involved with tonight's show. In this season so far, there's been some really high-profile incidents within the Premier League and Football League where there's structure and resource to tackle racism in football. In non-league, it doesn't seem to be quite the same. Is it something you think needs to be looked at as a matter of urgency? Yeah, I'm going to say it, it, it's, it's twofold for me. Um, the first one is that um, under the Football Offences Act 1991, police officers um, can arrest people who are um, chanting racist abuse. Um, it's, it's, it's a power that's uh, reserved for police officers only and that's where the second part of the, my argument or my, my discussion comes in is that in non-league football you're not going to have mm. a police officer uh, at a non-league game. Yeah. On top of that as well, it only, um, it only uh, comes into play for designated football matches and designated football matches only go down as far as the National League. So anything below that, the Football Offences Act doesn't come into play in relation to, as I said, police officers being able to arrest them. Um, so anything below that, it comes under the Public Order Act. There are too many uh, instances of this being reported. But more importantly, in my opinion, is that there's too many instances that are not being reported. And I think that the more times that it's brought to the attention of the press, um, either via social media or through uh, the non-league paper, I think that we need to drive that forward. Mm. And speaking this week on the phone to um, uh, Anwar Udin, who's involved in uh, Kick It Out and um, uh, his own um, um, charitable organisation in relation to try and get more uh, fans in grounds and that, he's a massive advocate for what I've just said in relation to the fact that it should be reported a lot more. And looking back, um, David, at the non-league paper, back in 2015, you did a survey with your readers where over 50% had heard racist comments and then 33% had heard them that season. It's an issue that we can't say that we're blind to. Why has nothing happened from, from then till now, do you think? Well, I think, um, firstly, from a press point of view and, and media, I think, as Jim touched on there, you have to get stories like this out of, of it happening to, to make people aware that this is an issue. Um, it, just this season, we've had two front page stories. The first one, um, an alleged incident with Ever Adams, the Ever Street player, um, against Aldershot earlier mm -hmm. in the season. And then uh, more recently, the issue um, with Chesterfield and, and Graham Bean, their CEO, uh, his statement on, on what he said with the incidents that involved uh, uh, Nathan and Ever Street. Um, you know, we won't, as a paper, shy away from, from these things. It's our duty to, to report them. We're not saying ever that clubs are, have done this thing. It's allegations. We're, we're reporting what has been effectively reported to have happened. Um, and in cases like the, the Aldershot one, the, the police have got involved and, and Chesterfield as well. Um, you have to get this message out there. Um, and in a way, it's sort of educating people that there's still this issue and I think once people know that they can um, start sort of almost self-policing, self-policing each other, their fans, because like you've said there isn't the police or, or the stewards or the people who are going to stop this and football mm. grounds particularly low down. Um, so I think uh, as a press, a newspaper, you, you've got to try and do what you can to, to, to sort of try and uh, stamp this out of the game because it, it is a really serious issue. and. Um, you know, from a non-league paper's point of view, we try and bang the drum for for the lower leagues, but you know we can't just avoid these issues when when they come about. Nathan, it's happened to you. It's happened to a teammate this season alone. Do you think it's rife week in week out? It just takes certain characters and certain personalities to really take the process from start to finish. Um, I would say so. Yeah, um, it's it's tough coming out and talking about it because I've been battered numerous times this season, it's like, oh, shock, it's him again. Oh, shock, it's, it's down to him. He must be doing something wrong. And it's, it is hard to come out and talk, but why should I be afraid to talk about something that, that's happened all my career and, and, and not do anything about it at, at this position? Because it's happened to me numerous of times. I, I don't want to be the person who's like, oh, it's happened to him again. Shock, he must be, he's time-wasting, he deserves it, he does this, he does that. I just just want to open people's eyes just to just to let them know that this still goes on and it's hard and it's it is tough especially when fans send me personal messages on social media it's it's tough it really really is tough and and I heard today uh, at Cheltenham uh, they played I think they played Mans uh, Macclesfield Sol Campbell had issues at their ground 
exactly the same as one with me when I played that their, their their fans their fans were disgusting towards me. I don't I don't know them as a as a team or, or as a as a club. I don't know anything about the history or anything like that. But when I played in that FA Cup game up there, it was it was hard, man. I, I wanted to walk off the pitch. Some of the stuff that has been said to me, it was it was disgusting. I, I shed a, shed a tear when I was playing football, and some of the players that were in 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 my team turned around and like asking me, "Are you alright?" And I was just like, just shaking my head and it's, it's in shock, really. And I just didn't want to play. And honestly, after after the game, I just said to myself, "I'm I'm done with football." I said, I, "I've had enough." I said, "I I don't want to play anymore." And for me to say that as well, it it hurt, it really did hurt. For two weeks, I didn't get any sleep because I was getting messages from like personal attacks and messaging. It was, it was this, um, what happened was at Boring Wood as well. That was the next game. So I was just getting personal attack left, right and centre and, and I just, just didn't like football. I just fell out of love with the game for a, at that moment. It was, it was hard, really, really was hard. But I'm, I'm glad I stood up and what I believe in. Obviously, in some people's eyes, it might not be right going over the banister, but in my eyes, I'm standing what I believe in and I'm not glad I've done it because as soon as I've done it, I've regretted it, but it's kind of made front front page. So it's getting to people talk about it and it was the same weekend as, as the Sterling thing as well. So it's, it's just opening people's eyes really. Um, and that's, that's, all I, that's all I can do and that's all I can say. Frank, what more can we do to open people's eyes to this issue? Because it seems to be that headlines like that provoke a debate and there are some mm -hmm. people out there that are uh, maybe turning a blind eye to the fact that racism and, and other forms of discrimination too exist in non-league football. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, first and foremost, we all agree, Nathan should be enormously proud of himself to, to speak up and to bring to everybody's attention his personal experiences of some of the negative connotations that attach themselves to football, sadly. Um, in terms of, it might be a bit of a general statement, but I think that in some divisions, some tiers of football, some clubs... I think that my opinion on why not enough is done is because I think that some clubs are so dependent, so reliable on gate receipts and how many people come to their games that they are ignorant to what goes on in the terraces and in the stands. You know, they, they almost don't want to know the sort of ins and outs of what happens on a match day. I mean, if that is the case, then shame on them. Yeah, well, you know, that's disgraceful. I, I'm, I'm talking from... Uh, and again, I've got to be careful what I say. Not a personal experience in terms of the club that I've managed, but I've certainly seen examples of distasteful behaviour or examples of things that have happened at games that I've managed at and been at that shouldn't be happening, that are pretty obvious that it's going on, but you know, clubs don't do enough about it. And again, I don't know whether it comes down to a point that Jim made about resources and maybe people think that depending on how serious the offence might be in this in this instance we talk about racism which is you know extremely serious maybe some clubs think that a police presence or something like it is the only deterrent it's the only way of stopping it from happening there are the extremes aren't they with like kick it out who you know we did try to arrange to get on the show and i'm sure we will get them in at some point and um, this season but from like educational courses to lifelong bans. Nathan, you actually went through the process, didn't you, of, did, of prosecution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the result at the end of it, given that you had to give up time training and traveling and, and mm -hmm. going through that process as a victim, the sanction at the end of it was just pitiful, really, wasn't it? Well, it was, he, he got banned for the club for life, but he, what, what the, the police and the investigators wanted was a, a football life ban for so many years or, or a life ban itself, and which is, you can't travel when England are playing away in, in any competition not outside England. You can't travel to any away game, can't travel to any, any football game or any sports arena. But they, the, the judge seemed it as too excessive, really. So you kind, of, you kind of got, you can't go to the club, back to the Eastleigh Football Club every game, which in my eyes is still a, a result, but is it a good enough result? Because you can just go elsewhere and do it again, maybe. But this is this, this, this the thing, I, I think you've, you take one person, give them a hefty ban or wherever, wherever it happens again, give them a massive, massive ban, life ban, it's friends a life ban if they're, if, if they're with it and, and still doing it with them as well. And then you just start from there. And then people might just seem, oh, I don't really fancy saying that. Do I really fancy saying that? And then missing out on like five, six hundred pounds season mm -hmm. ticket I've already paid for. And the thing is what they don't understand as well, if they get arrested or get kicked out by the, by the old bill, it's on their criminal record. 
That's the thing. When they grow up and want to get a job, that's going to be on, and they get a CRB chair, they're, they're going to be on their record. Mm-hmm. So they do, do they really want to do that just for the sake of trying to piss a goalkeeper off or putting him off? It's, it's just, just think of the bigger picture. Mm. I, I think there's also this idea that a lot of the time it's one or two or a minority that are, are, are doing these things and, and it's sort of almost brushed under the carpet mm. that, oh, well, they've been dealt with, then, you know, that's, that's it for the problem. But, you know, wh- why don't we just start deducting clubs' points for, mm. for these things? And, you know, if you really want to clamp, clamp something out that's or get rid of it, yeah. you know, why don't, why don't we just start doing that? And you say, well, you know, we're pu- punishing thousands of other people for the action of two, but... At the end of the day, you know, it's, yeah. it's football, really, yeah. isn't it? You all so, represent the same. Yeah, yeah. And well, I think it also helps then self-police fans amongst amongst themselves, really. And you know, if you hear something, you, you know, you point them out and you, you, where, know, you get rid of them. Where are the people in his examples? Where are the fans that are stood behind the goal? Because <clears throat> they get a lot of people that go and watch mm. the games at that level of football. Where are the people that are stood side by side with these people and tolerating it? Why are people sat there allowing someone next to them, kids, everyone, all age groups, demographics, whatever, why are people allowed to go and watch off a game of football and why are people tolerating that fella, that woman over there, saying what she said which is, or what he said, which is just out of line? And I mean, it's inter- sorry, Charlie, it's interesting about this. I knew Nathan was coming on tonight, so I've done a little bit of research today. I, you know, I think it's important that we get across it. It's not just a, an English uh, problem. It's not... So at the same time, as you mentioned about um, going over the barriers in December, uh, in Spain, Barcelona B, a recent signing for them, um, Musa Wake went to retrieve a ball uh, for a throw-in, got a lot of racial abuse, and as a result of that, he's pushed uh, a member of the crowd in the chest, which obviously then uh, inflamed the situation around all those people around the supporter. But what I found interesting, there's a video on, it's in, on the Independent uh, website, you know, the referee comes running straight over and brandished the red card directly towards the player first without taking a little bit of time Mm. and thinking, well, why would you do that? And then in in Italy um, over the Christmas period as well, uh, for Napoli, um, one of the players was receiving racial abuse for the whole game, got a second yellow card because literally his head had gone, uh, he he sarcastically clapped the referee, uh, of which the referee agreed to, but still gave him the second yellow card. Uh, Inter Milan have been um, told they can only, they, they've can they got to play two games behind closed doors, but they still send the player off. And, and, and Ancelotti, moving on, has said that if it happens again, he'll have no hesitations in saying to his team, off the pitch, mm. off the pitch. Now, when I was managing, I would have done exactly the same. But it'll have a, it'll have a know, bigger impact if, if players in that. Because then the league would have to... They'll have to do Deal something, yeah. They'll exactly. have to do something to Whether or not he's it's pro happening. at that time for mm-hmm. them or not. But at the end of the day, you're right, it's bringing it to the fore, isn't it? And as a player, obviously, you'll have the support of your teammates in your club. But further afield, was there any support from the league when you were going through these experiences? Um, in the past, there hasn't. But recently, there's been some great support. Like even supporters, random supporters, I was getting loads of good messages. I even got a Christmas card for one fan who was a Berry fan. It, 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 and I got it just before, just before a game as well, which, which lifted me up mm-hmm. so much. It, it, it's just minor little things like that, but that's, that's why football's so good. And that's the, the good side of it. But I like to say, um, football kick it out as well. They contacted me. Cause I know someone who was there as well. He just messaged me and said, oh, you're okay. Do you need, do you need us to, to talk to you? don't have any hesitations to, to ring us up. So that was great. And I had backing from the FA, which, 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 was, which was good. And Nathan obviously is at the professional part of the game. But if we look lower down in the leagues to, to players that, you know, might experience something like that and then go back to their part-time job as a plumber, teacher or whatever, there's probably, we're assessing the support that Nathan's got, but below that there's probably even less. Do you think the reporting mechanisms are in place for, for players that aren't within the professional game? Um, well, I can't speak personally about any experiences, and you know I don't have the knowledge of of that to be honest. Um, but what I would say is worrying when you hear Nathan talk is about how he wanted to walk off the pitch and yeah. you know he shed a tear and during the game, and and you think you know Nathan and none of us started watching or playing or, or managing in football for anything else. We all do it because we we enjoy the game and 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 like doing it. Um, mm it's sad that something can affect your enjoyment of it and, and makes you not want to do it. Um, you know, I, I think, 
you know, that's something I, I've taken from Nathan this evening is, is about how it really affects his enjoyment of the game, and mm. you know that, that's not right. To want to walk off a football pitch and not play and do what you're best at, Jim, it does kind of sum up the situation that we're in within non-league football. Um, what would you introduce to, to try and change it? And also, like from a welfare point of view for players, do you think there's enough support? Obviously, your management experience as well. If one of your players came to you, would would you have known what exactly to help them out with? Um, I think I would have done personally. Obviously, I'm a police officer, so from from the legal point of view, I would have firstly, because if someone comes to me and reports a crime, I've got to deal with that as a police officer first and foremost. Do you think ten, people ten... realise it is a crime? Do you think people yes. are aware yeah. of yeah, when they is... make that comment? Yeah, I don't think everyone knows being racist or, or even homophobic, anything... They don't realise it's a hate they crime. Don't, yeah, they don't realise it actually is a hate crime and you can get a criminal record for that and you can go to court and stuff. I don't, it's the, like, the younger people don't really know and they just see it as, oh, I'm just going to attack this person today and just, nah, because I feel like it. And sadly though, the younger people are only copying what their yeah, peers yeah, that's what I mean. their father or I, their I was, I was, older brother or was, people around them that are yeah, doing it. Yeah, I was at a game yeah. and... One one older man shouted out something, and a little kid, no no older than nine years old, yeah. copied what he said, yeah. and what he said was disgusting. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh my god. Yeah. And then the the bloke said, oh, well done, son. Oh, that's ridiculous. And, he, and then he's done that. He's copied. So now he's going to yeah. grow up, and he's going to do that. Yeah. And it's just around a vicious cycle. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so you're sorry. What you asked about how can they educate people? Well, well, first, an easy one for me is literally inside page of every program, whatever. There is their terms, conditions of how you've got to behave at their football club. If you if you go against racist, homophobic, or whatever it is, um, then you'll be ejected from the state and, and never be allowed back into the ground straight away. Because it, it, sometimes it's, it's I, I think clubs, I don't want to come across it the wrong way, need to cover themselves. I just think that they need to be doing the right thing before things happen. So be preventative rather than you know yeah. reactive, proactivity rather than reactive. You know. Get the message out through their web page. Get the message out through their fans forums. Get it out in the program that this this behaviour won't be tolerated and it is against the law. I think that I think that one of the biggest problems that we have is that specifically talking about football and non-league football is it's an aggressive environment, mm -hmm. right? So it's highly <laughs> competitive by nature. Therefore, with high stakes on the line, points, but in some cases at some levels, money. Contracts for, for the following season. There you go. It's it's aggressive in, in its nature. And if it's not racial abuse or something like that, it's aggressive in terms of the types of language that gets used by supporters. We've all been involved in it. We've all been 1-0 down in a game. And we've all heard our own supporters get angry and irate at the opposition delaying a throw-in, mm -hmm. goalkeeper delaying a goal kick. Yeah, it might not be racist slurs that get shouted out to the individual, to the team or to the referee, but it's, aggress it's aggressive language. And it just, it, it seems to have evolved whereby, because people are getting away with it and it's not being challenged and dealt with I properly. It's, right, it's fine, it's all right. People just take it to the next level mm -hmm. and then the next level and the next level. And Kick It Out do an annual review of the number of reports of discrimination that are brought forward in football. And every year for the past six years, there's been an increase. Last year alone, David, there was an 11% increase. Do you think that is because of the work they're doing in raising awareness about how to report discrimination? Or do you think the volume of cases are just going up? Because that's an argument as well. We all wear the T-shirts. We see that you know, on Premier League match of the day. Are we actually slightly more aware of the issue? And because we want to tackle it, we're seeing the reports go up? Yeah, you can probably view it in two ways, really, in that they've gone up because people are reporting these things, which is obviously is good. But obviously, at the same time, you'd, you'd want that number going down because then mm -hmm. it, it proves that these things are being stamped <coughs> out. Um, but I think it has to go up before mm, it goes I down, I think. Yeah. Mm. So, you, so you get the true levels yeah. of actually what mm. we're dealing with. I think it needs to find that plateau and then you, you know exactly what you've got to do to, to yeah, draw Yeah, and, and hopefully... Yeah. In the coming years, and you'll, you'll see that see that decline. Um, I do think generally, it is spoken about more and more. Um, I mean, when there was the case of Raheem Sterling a couple of months ago, I mean that was a that was a really big story, and you know I, I think a lot of people would have would have seen that and, and read it and and, and know it's, what was it's, happened. It's like, that's happened, but like now it's, it feels like it's just been brushed under the carpet. No one really like it's it's. 
been and done. No one knows what, what the guys have actually got. I don't, I don't know what they've got. They've got a, like a ban and order at the club or if it's going to go to court. And no one's really talking about it. Now it's kind of like dead water. So it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard one. I think that, I think my view on that is that I think that people are, I think that people are scared that if, if the, the more it happens, the more it happens. I don't want to sound dark by saying that, but I think that people are, are obviously fearful that if they if they carry on talking about it and they carry on raising awareness, that the people that are responsible for it are just going to keep doing it because they know that it's causing yeah. a reaction. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like a game of chance where the authorities are taking a stance as to bring it to everybody's attention. In these examples that we've discussed today, okay, we're, be, we're see, being seen to dealing with it. But we don't want to keep, keep to, raising yeah. awareness because, well, that incite more. That's my fear, that these things are going to happen more because because we are challenged with too many people. Too many people that do it, too many people responsible for it. And in my honest opinion, I think it's, at the moment, I think it's too difficult to police. I think it's too difficult to eradicate. But mm-hmm. I think it's always been there. I don't think, it, I don't think for one, it ever went away. No, I'm, I'm exactly the I same. I think it's always been there, sadly. 100%. But with the increase and in the availability of social media, it's more widely yeah. reported. Yeah. So that's why more people so think... Social like, media nowadays is a massive, yeah. massive yeah. thing. I mean, you mentioned it earlier, Nathan, about uh, he, 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 he wastes time. And I remember reading a real long saying on one of the tweets and whatever, and it said, do you know what? He deserved it. He, he wasted every single second of that game. And I, and, I'm, and, I, and I read it and I think about this guy. You've put this on social, social media. media. Mm-hmm. Do you know how pathetic you sound? Mm. You know, backing it, a racist abuse because it wastes time. Can't and it, it means that the, the effects of it carry on, don't they? It's not just 90 minutes on a football pitch anymore. This yeah. is like affecting like Nathan personally online, yeah. at home, away from work. Ultimately, there'll come a point where a footballer says, like, you almost did. Do you know what? I've had enough. I don't want to do it anymore. Mm. How much does that online presence, do you think, inflame the situation as well? Oh, massively. Like, like, you, like, like you said, a, a game lasts for 90 minutes. Normally, you get peppered for 90 minutes, and then that's it at the end of it. Now, it goes on for about three or four days. But I'm still, I, I still get messages. Like, if, if something like this happens, I'll still get messages from fans that I played last season and be like, oh yeah, he's done that at our club, like, yeah, he's a, he's a this, he's a that. So it, is, it has a massive, massive impact on, on uh, social media. Like, we had, a, week, we had a, week, a weekend off, and I got rid of it for the whole weekend. Um, and I've never felt better, in, in all honesty. Um, it's something I'll, 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 I'm going to think about, get, just get rid of it all but you together. Oh, that's the thing. You, know I mean? I, I you, you, you communicate via that. That's what to I mean. People, and, and, and it raises my profile yeah, as course, well. Like exactly if I have right. like a good game or something, yeah. it raises my profile. But it, it's, it's tough when you get them personal messages. Yeah. I know I you can't let it affect you, but and it show it like no, as footballers, we'll never ever talk about it because it shows some kind of weakness to to other players, and you shouldn't really do that. And but it's tough, man. It, it really, really is. But when you get them personal messages, I know you can't, you, you, you don't have to read them, but when you get so many, I'd rather just get rid of the whole thing and just, just not, not have to think about it and worry about it. In your experiences, though, you've talked about some of the incidents that have happened, but compared to how many incidents that you've actually been involved in, have you, have you mentioned every single, you know, do you, do you report everything that ever gets said to you in a game and throughout your whole career in terms of, that as well, because what you've done effectively is build up a tough skin. Yeah. Where you probably, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but you probably think about, you know, you're, you're selfless enough to think about your teammates and think, it might distract them today mm-hmm. if I bring this up, or I don't yeah. want to go to the gaffer and say about this, because we've exactly. got to get yeah. three points yeah. today, yeah. and I don't want to be seen to be the one that's mm. always saying that yeah. something's about it, and that in itself is, is wrong. He's being repressed to think, actually, I can't come out and say what I actually hear and what I feel, because I'm a professional football player and I've got a job to do mm. and I'm putting my team and my gaffer and, and my fans first and I don't want to be a distraction, which is wrong on every account. It just highlights the complexity of it all as well and the, and the impact it can have not only on your performance on a pitch but mental health and other things like that. Um, that's probably just about all we've got time for to discuss the topic of racism in football, but that doesn't mean the debate is over. Let us know what you think. Connect with us on our social media channels at official BOTN. And Nathan, talking about what you do best on the pitch, last week a fantastic result away at um, Leighton Orient, man of the match performance for yourself. And that was after you know a couple of weeks where you had had an awful win, so I guess it's credit to you. But tell us about that and, and how much a run of form Fleet have been on recently. Yeah, we're, we're, we're playing 
unbelievable at the moment, to be fair. Like, I think in the last, I think we're the top in the last 15 games in the forum table, which, which is unbelievable for the boys as well. We just, we literally just gone back to basics now, defend first, and and then we, we build build it from there. I think we've kept, I think we've got like seven games unbeaten in a row at home, which which is which is good form, and we're obviously Lake Norton coming to us, top of the table. We're top of the form table. It was it was a good game, um, and personally, I had a good game as well. Um, so we got the three points, and we can just just build on it like that, really. So we, we can't really look look on to anything else. We just got to take one game at a time and, and go from there. And you were in the non-league papers team of the day last week, and then this week your counterpart at Sutton United, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he took your place. <laughs> but I guess that really highlights the game itself. It was the end of your unbeaten run, mm -hmm. in probably the most. Unfortunate circumstances yeah, in the 94th yeah, was, minute, but credit to him as another goalkeeper. Did he keep yeah, him in? Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, I know. I know Ross as well. He's, he's, he's a good lad. He's just come back from injury as well, and he's, he's been out on loan a few times. And uh, he's a great keeper as well. I think um, so. It's a credit to him have it, to, to go injured and then coming back and getting to the team of the team of the team of the weekend. It's, it's, it's phenomenal for him. And David, was there anyone else in that team of the day that caught your eye at the weekend? Um, well, Danny Rose almost mm -hmm. sort of. Got himself a consistent place in there, much like Nathan actually. Yeah. Um, you know, two more goals uh, this weekend for Fylde and their win at Solihull. Um, you know, not many teams have been going there and, and winning this season. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that almost just sort of shows the development from Fylde from last season. Um, they're, kind of, kind of, they're kind of hitting the the winning streak at yeah. the right time, just just before the end yeah, of the season. Yeah, and, and I think sort of when you look at them last season, they were just. In games where you thought, oh, they'll they'll win there, they they didn't. But then at home they're beating lots of Macclesfield. Mm -hmm. I think they put six past mm -hmm. them, six past Aldershot. Um, and yeah, and Danny Rose, such a key part of their their team. You know, you, you see his name on the score sheet, and it just becomes usual. He's, he's twenty one for the he's season a now. Great guy, but he's annoying to play against because <laughs> he he would do nothing for the whole game, yeah, but he would yeah. score one goal or two goals. He'd done the same when we played like that. We lost two 0 and uh, he didn't really do much. We kept him quiet. Just got a deflected goal, and it landed straight in front of him. <laughs> Open yeah. goal, and he scores. But that, but that's what that's what you call a good striker. Yeah, natural goal scorer. Yeah. Really puts himself in positions. You know, you said there he wasn't so much involved in that game. But when I've seen him, he does bring other mm. players. Into yeah, of course. Yeah, you can, you can play into his feet and and get it back off him. Um, and I think every. Team needs that sort of talisman. You know, you look at Macaulay Bond at, at Leighton Orient, and, and you think, wow, you know, if we were out without him this weekend, we'd, we'd probably struggle. Yeah. Nathan, was there anyone else in that team of the week that, that caught your eye? Or uh, anyone you've played against? Andres him? Robinson. He um, had a good game against Boreham Woods, scored a free kick. I used to play with him at Gosport, so great, te great technical ability. So it's, it's nice for him to, to get back into to the team and start scoring and playing well. And it would be remiss of us not to mention um, Barnet, Jim, and their result, um, the final side left from non-league in the Emirates FA Cup, and what a cracking game it was at the Hive. It was a magnificent game of football, um, regardless of them being uh, a non-league side. Um, three all, I think, was probably a fair result. And to be honest, I mean, I, I mean I, they, they may be a little bit disappointed to not have gone through on the night, but another great opportunity for them to play in the replay uh, on television, as I understand it as well. Packed house. Mm -hmm. I think we'll all be looking forward to um, seeing you the replay. You can that. kind of say they got robbed, kind of thing, because they, they, they shouldn't have never been a penalty. No, no we it never, I mean, never been a pen. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> it was very harsh. I mean, that opens its own debate. I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 it's a dive for me all day long. It was mm -hmm. a dive, you know. I don't know how the line has not just not helped him out there. Exactly right. And we we, we talk about referees, uh, assistant referees, week in week out. Mm -hmm. Sadly, I mean, that one uh, should have he should have helped the referee mm -hmm. out then. And so you could say, yeah. Were they robbed? Maybe. I mean, but, but it, Brentford yeah. they had quite a few good opportunities. It's, 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 well. it's, a, it's a good <coughs> advertisement for non-league football. Wasn't it? Yeah, brilliant. And the quality of the strikes as well. Like Nathan was saying, it was a fantastic advert, and it really showcased like non-league football. Sometimes there's been stereotypes of the ball being hoofed up in the air mm. and stuff like that, but. The way that Barnet played and the quality of the goals that they scored mm. may have like not an impact only on their attendances for the next few weeks, but maybe other people looking at their local non-league club to pop down on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, I think they had over 6,000 there for that game in itself, which is enormous. Mm. Um, and I think the stereotype of non-league football is, is changing. Um, what, what we've known it in terms of it being direct and physical, mm. yes, it has those attributes, but what we're seeing now is... The progression of teams that are getting through to the latter stage of the FA Cup, taking big scalp, but not doing it the non-league way, yeah, per se, yeah. actually saying, you know what, 
we can get the ball down and play. We've got good technical players, and we have a, we have a method of, of how we want to play, and it's not just go back to front quickly. Yeah, Connor, um, I'm not afraid to play against the, the, the full-time teams or the, yeah. the football league sides. You know? I think it brings it out when you yeah. play a full-time team and mm. a higher team. Good habits rub off on you as a player, and I think that what you see a lot of is, in that example, however, Brentford, the Brentford's template of how they play, I'm sure on the night, Barnet players would have been thinking and adjusting to that and mirroring it. Yeah. I think that's what you get to see a lot of in the FA Cup between teams that are separated by tiers of football. I think when Carrie took over from Stilly anyway, um, he's completely changed the way that they're, they're playing. Yeah, they are getting the ball sense. down. Um, you know, and they're, they're going through transitions, they're playing through their midfield. It, it, I mean, the game was just, you know, it was brilliant to watch, mm -hmm. it really was. And David, I was reading an article mm -hmm. the other day about how the Emirates FA Cup has kind of been its most magical for years. And do you think that is in part because of the professionalism we're seeing in, within non-league football now? So that, you know, we're looking at games where it might have been a David and Goliath situation, but actually people are realising these non-league clubs now have great setups, great players, and therefore we're getting some really, really entertaining games. Yeah, we well, just have to look at the National League and how many full-time sides they're in there mm. now and, and how many of those clubs have played in the Football League as well. I mean, there's some... Really incredible setups. I mean, when you go to Leighton Orient, you always go there and think, "Wow!" Yeah. You know, even the, the lots of Salford. I know their grounds a little bit smaller, but even you go there and you just think they're going to they're doing something. They're doing it the right way. Yeah, exactly. And I think, like we've sort of touched on there, the stereotype of non-league has changed. I mean, you look at Barnet the other night. That pitch was perfect. It wasn't a mud bath. They weren't playing four four two. You know, I, I think it is changing, and the, and the FA Cup is built on upsets. That's that's why we all love it so much, and why it's supposedly the best competition in the world. Um, you know, I, I love seeing the the first few rounds of, of the competition and thinking, oh, where's the shot going to come? Mm. And then when it does come through, it, it's it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, you know, as the guys have said, it was just a superb advert for the. For, for non-league and, and the competition and uh, yeah, certainly one of the best games I've seen. I've read that you know they, they could be a little bit disappointed with the draw they got away at, away Swan at Swansea. Swansea yeah. I think they'll take that all <laughs> yeah, day long, yeah. won't they? Beat Sheffield United. Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. disappointed yeah. for them though. Yeah. Well, yeah. Especially, yeah. Left yeah. Especially the thought... teams left in it because you've, yeah, you've still got Portsmouth in there, you've got yeah, Man United and stuff. Such a feat to get and to where they're not. And a big one Chelsea. Yeah, and a big one Chelsea, yeah. Not for them. Well, we'll wish Barnet the best in their replay. And finally, just looking at one of the main stories in the non-league football paper, and one that has been linking to what we've just touched upon there. Um, David, tell us a bit about this story and the FA's vision for a bright future for non-league and the restructuring. Yeah, so Lawrence Jones, uh, we spoke to him at the FA. Uh, he's the head of the National League system. So they uh, basically are in charge from National League down, right down to the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and so it was a yeah, really interesting sort of column in there, uh, basically about the FA's plans for the future, talking about England Sea, um, big fans of that. Uh, but one of the main headlines was the um, restructuring at step three and four. See, we've seen this season um, how you've got four uh, divisions at step three and then more at step four. Um, and basically Lawrence was saying how uh, next season they're going to try and put in place uh, two automatic promotions uh, spots from step three. So going back to the normal champions go mm -hmm. up and then the playoff winners. Obviously now you've got the super playoffs, yeah. um, which will be interesting in the, in the next few months as people try and get their heads around. Um, but obviously that does mean in order to do that, eight teams are going up. So you have four down from step two in the north and south. Um, which is almost sort of the first step you would think to moving towards three up, three down from the Football League. Yeah, I'll, I'll, the National I'll, League. I'll, I'll passionately go with, there have got to be more teams going up from our league into to League Two. Because you look at the teams in, in, our, in our level now, like the Lake Norwich, Salford and stuff, they're, they're massive, massive mm. teams. Mm. So there sh should be another little, a little carrot at the end of it, like first and, first and second should automatically go up straight away and then you do the playoffs. Yeah. I, I think. It's yeah. interesting hearing your opinion on that because obviously you're recognising and acknowledging some of these massive teams that have been successful football league sides that have mm. dropped into the National League and you're almost saying that you, 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 you don't play for them but you want to see them go back up because you think they should be rewarded, which I think is an interesting mm. point because again it highlights the competitive nature of the league and like you say, you know, you've got big teams that could be sat down there for a number of seasons. Yeah, of course, yeah, look, yeah, look, Chesterfield died. 
they're, they're, they're near, near the bottom of bottom half of the table, and that's a that's a massive side. They're, yeah. they're a big. So they're playing the League One a couple yeah, of years right. ago, I think. So in the stadium, and the stadium, the stadium, uh, one know, of the best stadiums yeah. I've I've, I've yeah. played, well, apart from like Lake Norrin and stuff. And but it's unbelievable. Like mm. when when obviously what when we the, the game to play in that was was ridiculous. Like the fans are like the singing and stuff. It was it also awesome game to play in. But it's I just think two's not enough for our, our level, and it, plus it brings in. Low, low, sm smaller clubs like, like, like ourselves and stuff, like, not so much like a big fan base, but it, it gives us another chance to go yeah. into playoffs. Yeah, and, course, or if yeah. not, if you can nick second, it's nothing worse. You do all that hard work, yeah. finish second, and then you. you and there's no reward. There's no really no reward. And, you, and you, can, you could be better than anyone else for the whole season, finish second, and you might not even go through. Yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of harsh, really. So I, I, I think definitely three would be mm. great idea, I, personally, I think. And Jim, you're a vastly experienced non-league manager. What did you make of the article? And are there any changes that you think the FA can can help with to professionalise the sort of non-league setup or best practice to pinch from the football league? Well, I think to be fair, it's a, it's a really good um, post actually, well written, and and I, and I find it quite interesting that the FA are actually looking at this seriously um, to try and um, you know right the wrongs they've done this year because this super playoff further down the pyramid is just ridiculous. Big by you know by putting another league in, has, has put everything out of kilter. So mm -hmm. I think for one they've recognised the fact that it's wrong. Two, they're going to make amends and try and change it next year. And three, as you said, David, I think they're actually sending out a signal that longer term the plans will be that two will be going out from the national league. I think also worth remembering as well that this is actually this sort of season and, and maybe next one's almost <coughs> a transitional period for the pyramid structure yeah. this isn't the final product they're working towards a pure sort of more even structure uh, this is sort of very much a stopgap with the and as a result of that you've we've got the super playoffs and, and obviously the situation at step four where Teams that win in the playoff Don't final win. won't go up. Um, that's carnage. Oh, yeah, that's so true. that's you know, carnage. I sort of look at it and I think, you know, is it, was it worth putting the playoffs in there? Was it worth just doing, you know, two up from the league or something different? Um, and then maybe going back to it next year. Um, but I think ultimately the thing people have to remember is that, you know, this isn't the way it's going to be now. In future, the pyramid will be better for it. It kind of does kill teams, especially if, if you finish top and you don't go up. Especially if, like, if, they're, if they've got a big budget for that season, they think mm -hmm. they're going to go up. Then they realise they don't go up and they're like, well, we've set ourselves, we've set our budget of going up and we're not going up. So that means yeah. they'll have to cut the budget for, for the following season, lose some of their better players and then they might even be in a relegation battle the next season. It's, it's kind of harsh, really, I think. Yeah, well, what I would say, though, is that I really like the idea of extending the playoffs in, in the step one and step two. I think it keeps the league so much more competitive right to the end because often you see clubs who are mid-table who don't have so much to play for, they start trimming their squad and sort of you almost <coughs> predict that you can see results coming because of, because of that. How far um, down does it stretch to now in the National League in terms of the final playoff place? How many uh, teams are included? Seven, yeah, yeah. seven, yeah. Because we, we finished seventh last season by a goal, I think, or one point and we, mm. we just made it and we finished seventh and we got to the the semi-final, mm. but then that we only got in there from the last game of the season as well. We well, had some run, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, we had a good, we had, had a great. That's unbelievable, the reason why you yeah, made the, uh, the team yeah. of the year last year. Yeah, time. and that's and all, that's almost yeah. the point of it, though, is that you know if you can put a run together, you mm. can sneak in there and, and get yeah. in there on the last day of the season. Um, yeah, like I say, it just keeps it more competitive, more interesting, better for the fans and. Yeah, you know, you had a situation <coughs> last year at Step Two in in the South where Braintree finished, I think, sixth or seventh. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and Hampton was second all that yeah, season. Yeah, but obviously, <laughs> you know, the advantages of finishing higher up is that you've yeah. got the games at home. You've potentially got the final at home. You know, fair play to Braintree in a way because mm. they, they, you know, they went to Dartford, who who missed yeah. out you know, the last minute goal was to have them. Um, and then they went away again, and then obviously they they won at Hampton, so they did do it the hard way. Mm. Um, you know, is it right that the team who finishes 15 points higher yes. doesn't go up? I'm it's not quite, sure. It's, but it's it, kind of hard. Is that an impact of what's happened to them this season? Because they find themselves rock bottom mm. of the league. Yeah. The, the what? No disrespect. The worst, best team mm. to go up, finishing the, the furthest the field, mm. and now they're rock bottom of the national league, which goes to show that it's not nice getting pumped every week. Well, the thing is, that's, that's the thing. There is a there obviously is an enormous gulf between the teams that finish sixth and seventh that and can gain promotion mm. and then go up into the league above. 
that's how challenging it is. That's mm. how competitive it is because even the teams that get promoted first place can find it difficult. Mm. So. It's a really, really interesting article and really interesting to hear your guys' insight into it as well. That is about all we can cram into this week's non-league debate, which leaves me just enough time to thank our panellist, Jim Cooper, Frank Wilson, and our special guest this week, David Richardson from the non-league paper and Nathan Ashmore from Ebbsfleet United. Don't forget, you can let us know what you think on this week's episode. Share your thoughts, opinions and your experiences by connecting with us on social media, official BOTN. And that leaves me to say goodbye. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.